my name is uh, Martin Roos. I'm Deputy Director of the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute in Florence. And also on your screens, you can see my colleagues, uh, Bridget Anderson, who is at the University of Bristol, and Friedrich Peschel, who is also here at the MPC at the EUI. Um, Bridget, Friedrich, and I um, are the co-organizers of this, of this conference. And we've also been uh, developing Migres Hub together. Uh, not on your screen, you see two people who are usually mentioned at the end of the conference, but since this is an online conference, I just wanna mention and thank them at the beginning. Um, Kira Burbridge and uh, Giovanni Manetti have been doing a lot of work to make this uh, conference happen, also with the logistics and the tech support. So uh, Kira and Giovanni, thank you very much. Um, we'll, I will give a brief introduction of the conference to the conference, and then we'll go right into the conference program. You all have the program. You see, it's quite a tight, tight schedule. So we'll try to stick to time um, as uh, the best we can. Uh, as many of you know already, the, the primary aim of the Migrants and Systemic Resilience Hub is to facilitate research and policy debates on, on how migrant workers affect the resilience of the provision of essential services during the COVID pandemic, but also during future shocks, similar shocks in the future. And in a way, our starting point is that there could be positive effects. So migrants could contribute to the protection of essential services, but in some cases there might also be negative effects. So we are interested in the relationship between the employment of migrants on the one hand and the resilience of essential services uh, on the other. We are focusing on three sectors, uh, food and agriculture, health services, and social care. And we very much want to take a transnational approach that includes uh, transnational linkages, supply chains, and we want to take a comparative approach. So you want to see how different uh, policies and how different national policies and systems for providing social care, for example, fare under the, during the pandemic and to what extent that is related to their reliance on, on migrant workers. So, so that means a particular focus of the project will be to make comparison across different institutional contexts, which is why so many of today's participants come really from, from, a, from a number of different countries and regions of um, the world. As we'll say in the opening paper, one of the starting points of the project really is that there's been a lot of research on labor migration and also on the role of migrants in filling skills shortages. And there has been work on systemic resilience, on the resilience of systems, but those two types of research have generally been disconnected. Um, so the resilience work really has been happening in other disciplines, in other areas. And what we are trying to do is bring in people who work on different areas, different issues, and different issue, different disciplines, bring them together to see um, what we can learn from those other areas for this discussion uh, about migrants and systemic resilience during during COVID. Um, there's obviously we have an academic interest, so um, we are researchers, but we are also very much interested in forming policy debates. I mean, there's an obvious policy context to what we do. That one of the central challenges during the crisis has been to protect essential services. COVID has led to a number of uh, labor market shocks on the supply side, on the demand side, and how to keep some of these basic services resilient, how to keep them going has been a key, a key priority. And uh, we also know that there has been an apparent greater appreciation of, of migrants in some of these key sectors. We know that migrant workers often constitute a considerable share of workers in these sectors, in agriculture and care and the health sector. However, this share varies across countries, across different institutional um, contexts. So there's different types of health systems, different types of agricultural systems and care systems are associated with different degrees of reliance on migrant workers. And we're interested in finding out um, what these differences mean for, for resilience of these uh, services. And of course, one question is um, whether and to what extent uh, this apparent revaluation of the role of migrant workers leads to a bigger rethink 
of the impacts of migrants and also of labor migration and related public policies. So is this a time now when there needs to be a fundamental rethink about how migrants impact on economies and societies by putting a light on this, on this new, new goal or apparently uh, important new goal of systemic resilience, ensuring systemic resilience? Bridget, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Martin. So um, why a hub and uh, what do we mean by a hub? Well, I suppose um, uh, in the short term, we wanted to build a hub, which is um, the hub of a network of researchers, um, experts, academic and non-academic, uh, and also policymakers and practitioners who are interested in these questions so that we can bring together different perspectives, different interests, build a research agenda and facilitate dialogue which can include encouraging and informing policy debates around these questions. Uh, in the more mid to long term, we want to encourage the development of collaborative international and cross-national comparative research and policy projects that engage and inform policymakers and practitioners. So we very much want to build a hub that is of interest across the board to researchers, the policy and practitioner community, and that thinks outside the national box. So usually migration conversations are very much confined to thinking about particular states. We want to encourage people to think across states, across borders. Um, so more particularly, our website is there to encourage thinking and debate. Um, it's very much a website which is a work in progress, but if you take a look, you'll see that we've started to publish think pieces and shorter commentaries on key aspects of the overall issue. Um, and there's a particular focus on health, social care and food and agriculture. Um, uh, we've already received a number of commentaries, so please do take a look at the website. And we're very grateful for the contributions that we've received so far. Um, and have a look at the website and you can click on the how to contribute button and um, yeah, why don't you get writing? Um, we're going to be adding more commentaries in the coming weeks and months to both grow the, the network and the hub. Um, so today's conference is an opportunity to present and discuss some of the key themes and first contributions. So unfortunately, we don't have time to discuss them all, but the contributions we've received so far are on the website uh, and you'll find them listed in the conference program. Um, and uh, I hope they'll inspire you to make your own contributions. And I think importantly, we're not looking for consensus, we're looking for debate. Um, so in terms of the actual conference, um, the sessions mirror the key themes that we've identified. So we're going to start with an overview of resilience and its applicability to essential sectors. Um, we're then going to look at cross-country supply chains and intersections, thinking both regionally and globally, and then focus in on migrants and resilience in health, in social care and in agriculture. And we're very grateful to all our speakers for taking the time to come to the conference. Um, so as this is our first conference to launch MIG Res Hub, we've decided to organise one that facilitates relatively large numbers. So we'd ask you to turn off your camera if you are not a speaker. Um, each session includes about half an hour for questions and we've asked our speakers to keep to time. Um, if you have a question, could you please type them into the Zoom chat and um, ask them or direct them to the Migration Policy Centre. Uh, unfortunately, we can't take questions if they are not directed to the Migration Policy Centre. Um, Giovanni will then forward the questions to the relevant chair. So any questions, please write them in the chat box uh, and send them to the Migration Policy Centre. And um, with that, I'll hand over to Andrew, the chair of our first session. Just waiting for Andrew to be unmuted. And while that happens, I'll just say that the first session will be chaired by Andrew Geddes, who is the director of the Migration Policy Center. Thank you, Andrew, for agreeing to chair this session. There you go. Thanks, Martin. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Uh, thanks to you and Bridget and Friedrich for putting this all together. So very happy to be here for this first session. And the focus for the first session is uh, linking uh, systemic resilience to migration policies uh, and, and thinking about the research agenda associated with that. Just a minute, just need to get the information. Or linking to migration research and policies, sorry, linking systemic resilience to migration research and policies. So this first session will last for one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we have two presentations and we also very lucky to have two discussants with us. So I will very briefly say who they are. You can get all their bios from the uh, project program and the website. Uh, so the first presentation will be by uh, Bridget Anderson, uh, Martin Rusin, Friedrich Perschel, uh, combination of participants from University of Bristol and EUI. You've already heard from Bridget and Martin. Friedrich is a research fellow at the Migration Policy Centre. We'll then have a contribution from William Hines, who's a senior advisor to the Secretary General of the OECD and head of the New Approaches to Economic Challenges Unit. Uh, uh, then we'll have two comments, uh, uh, first of which from Laura Corrado, who's, who's the head of the Unit for Legal Pathways and Integration at DG Migration and Home Affairs of the European Commission and uh, also from Christian Kupch, who's a senior specialist in migration policy at the ILO. In total, the presentations will take around 35 minutes. Uh, so that will leave plenty of time for uh, questions, comments, uh, and discussion. I'd also, as, as Bridget also pointed out, on the uh, MIG Res Hub website, there are other contributions that have been made that link to this theme. And I would encourage you to take a look at those and, and also if you want to contribute to the work that's been produced already. So on there at the moment, you can find work by Rebecca Smith and Susanna Chepler on the role of quality, mo uh, of quality mobility industry in building systemic resilience. And then Kadrajanova from NPC on public attitudes to migrant workers, from Luisa Feline Fryer and Marta Luzes on uh, Venezuelan immigration, COVID-19 in the Andean region and Monique Kramer on a, a, a contribution called A Better Work Strategy is Necessary for Resilient Societies and Economies. And last but not least, Ha Yun Chang uh, as a podcast available on systemic resilience and, mi and migrant workers. So I'd encourage you to look at those. And also, if you want to contribute, uh, you'd be very welcome to do so. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Bridget, Martin and Friedrich. I'm not sure which who we're going to hear from first. Uh, as I say, the presentation lasts about 35 minutes. If you have questions, identify Migration Policy Centre as the host and send your questions to Migration Policy Centre and the list of participants. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to whoever of those three speakers is going to lead off. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we'll, uh, try it. we'll attempt to uh, make a joint effort uh, with this. So I will share my screen. So this, this first paper is, is meant as an overview paper. There is a written paper on, on the website. You see the reference um, at the bottom of this first slide. And um, what we are trying to do in this paper is to kind of take stock of existing research and also analyze how thinking about systemic resilience might take us beyond that and what that means, what that might mean for policy debates, but also for the research, research agenda. And um, so we know that there is quite a bit of existing research on the role that migrants play, can play in filling labor and skills shortages in various countries. Uh, there's been uh, quite a bit of work on that. What we want to focus on is this new question of systemic resilience. So the question is, how do migrant workers shape the resilience of the provision of essential goods and services during an external shock like the pandemic and to what extent and how does this vary across countries with different institutions and policies. And as I mentioned in the introduction, one of the main angles we wanna take is we want to integrate and combine research on labor migration, labor markets on the one hand and research on systemic resilience on the other hand. This is why you'll see on the website as well, some more broader pieces that look at systemic resilience in general and that then discuss potential implications for what we are trying to do. And, and it, I suppose the big picture policy question is to what extent a concern with resilience should make us rethink how we assess the impacts of migration and, and related policies. Um, learning from the past. So what do we know? We know, uh, as I said, from the literature 
on migrants and labor demand and shortages that uh, there's no universal definition of skills and shortages. When it comes to skills, we know there are hard versus soft skills. Um, I've rarely met an employer who, who says, who doesn't say that their workers are skilled in one way or another. So this issue of skill is really quite a contested one and an ambiguous one. Um, similarly, there's no one definition of a shortage. Economists like to think that labor shortages are determined critically by wages, among other things. If there is a shortage, wages should go up, in theory at least. Um, so there's different ways of, of measuring potential shortages. And importantly, there's a lot of debate about how one should respond to a given shortage. If we agree that there is a shortage of labor or skills, what's the policy response? And we know that immigration isn't necessarily the only response. There might be alternatives, such as raising wages, as I said, maybe mechanizing computerization in some sectors, maybe offshoring, or maybe stopping the production of certain products altogether. Of course, not all countries or not will have all of these options. Not all sectors will have all these options. But the point is that there are, there's often more than one option and immigration isn't necessarily the only response. We also know from existing research that the extent to which certain sectors rely on migrants depends very much on wider institutions and policies, what are known as system effects that produce certain labor shortages. So for example, if you have a country that has a poorly developed training system, for example, in production, uh, sorry, in, in the construction sector, there's a poor training system in the construction sector that will lead or that might lead to a demand for migrant workers. Um, and so in, one, in some way it's important to understand that since there's no single response to a shortage, this issue of how one should respond is inescapably a political issue. So there's a politics of labor and skill shortages which has to do about what are we trying to do, whose needs are we trying to serve, and then what is, what is the best response? So this is, we know quite a bit from existing research. Friedrich. Yeah, hello everyone. <clears throat> With this uh, figure, we wanted to uh, give you an idea of what systemic resilience looks like uh, because it can be seen, or it can seem like a very abstract concept. So uh, this is just uh, some development, the thick black line um, that is uh, uh, in a rising trend um, and then you have a shock hitting uh, in period zero of course the development takes a hit um, and um, goes somewhat goes somewhat down but then recovers over time and eventually regains the initial trend or might depending on the success of the adjustment to the shock might even go beyond the initial trend so this gives you an idea of what we're talking about a resilient system would come back uh, and recover like this uh, from a shock. And so we've looked at various uh, disciplines uh, in the social sciences of what features uh, belong to a resilient system. And uh, many have been identified, but three uh, that we want to mention here come up a lot uh, in, in various uh, disciplines. That is firstly, flexibility. So um, a resilient system would be uh, more or less, well, would be more independent of the status quo. Uh, the more independent, the better, because then it has room to adjust. Uh, also important is social capital, or sometimes it's called networks, in the sense that when the shock hits and when you have to adjust, you can rely on mutual support from uh, some network or from uh, through a social capital context. And finally, uh, it has been noted again and again that the institutional and policy environment um, really can make a big difference. If it's favorable, it can make, uh, it can contribute a lot to resilience. Thanks, Friedrich. So um, how do we introduce systemic resilience into the analysis and regulation of labor migration? So we've got four um, suggestions. The first is to shift the focus to transnational systems. Um, so uh, for example, some of the um, examples that Martin gave of the uh, previous literature on uh, non-migration responses to um, uh, questions of um, um, uh, migrants and impact on labor market were very much actually within thinking within a national box. So you might, for example, 
decide that you're not going to produce soft fruit because of a demand because um, it requires migration you'll import soft fruit but actually that soft fruit might well uh, that that um, country the state from which you're importing the soft fruit might well actually rely on migrant labor so you're not necessarily stopping a reliance on migrant labor so if we think about transnational systems um, then that introduces new sorts of questions um, it also means it also demands that we think more carefully about the situation in sending countries and also the risk of increase of exporting vulnerability so um, uh, increasing one state's resilience at the expense of another's vulnerability the second um, uh, approach is to move from prioritizing the employment of citizens to protecting the provision of essential services. Now, on the one hand, it might be there might be some wriggle room, particularly given the uh, recognition in some states of the role of migrant labor in the provision of essential services, such as um, health and agriculture. So there might be more sympathy, more engagement with migration questions from that point of view. However, what um, that, that might be at the expense of migrants themselves. So actually the provision of essential, the reason that migrants might be available to provide essential services is precisely because of um, flexibility, of greater uh, exploitation, and so on. So um, we need to think about what some people have characterized as uh, the disposability of essential workers and how migration might also facilitate that disposability, despite their, um, the provision of essential services. Um, we also want to look at the move from short term to long term. There is a lot of pressure on um, both politicians and policymakers because of electoral cycles to think very much in terms of short term, but also on some employers, uh, the uh, short term profitability might determine the temporal framing, but resilience requires a different kind of temporal frame. So we think that um, we need to think more about the long term uh, and introduce long term questions of long term as well as short term. Uh, and also to take seriously um, the temporalities of workers. So as we know from previous literature, migrants in particular might be prepared to um, uh, trade off um, uh, short-term uh, poor conditions uh, low, um, and relatively low wages uh, in order to achieve their long-term goals. So all of this suggests a new politics of labor migration and um, uh, and the importance of rethinking the politics of labor migration. Uh, and just to give two kind of questions around this, the first is to ask when do national borders facilitate um, resilience and when do they undermine resilience? So what is the role of national borders in, um, in promoting or undermining resilience? And the second is this question of essential versus uh, disposable workers or essential and or disposable workers. Uh, next slide, please, Martin. Uh, yes, yeah, so a new agenda. How do migrants shape systemic resilience? Um, so we think it's very important to think about how we uh, do comparative research. Uh, and there are various axes of comparison that we can do. Um, the first is comparing migrants and citizens employed within the same system. So what, how do migrants and citizens who are essentially doing the same job within, um, uh, within the same system, how, do their, how does their promotion or undermining of resilience work? Comparing migrants' roles across systems. So I gave the example of um, soft fruit. So let's think about um, how migrants figure across whole supply chains, not just within particular um, states. Comparing the choices and determinants of resilient strategies across systems, as I say, not thinking within a nation state box, and therefore thinking beyond the analysis of exploitation of migrants in low skilled jobs. So, to uh, give you an example of how um, one can start with, the, with an empirical analysis, um, this is uh, some first insight from um, 
joint work with Anton Nivodoshkin at uh, the Institute for Employment uh, Studies, IAB in Nuremberg. Um, we were looking at uh, essential jobs, just a set of essential jobs in Germany, according to some official list. And our question uh, here for these results is which essential jobs are performed by migrants? And through related class analysis, one can identify groups of uh, similar jobs. And the first group here is uh, pretty large, almost 60% on the left. Uh, these are standard jobs with high job security and regular hours and rather good working conditions. Second group, 20% uh, almost uh, are managerial jobs with high pay, high job security, varying hours and good working conditions. And then we get to group three, uh, which is comparable to group one, but actually with bad working conditions and more often low pay. And the last uh, and smallest group uh, is often temporary jobs with low pay, rather bad working conditions and a bad work climate in terms of relations with colleagues and bosses. So I've given you here some examples of um, the uh, occupations in these groups that uh, um, you will find occupations uh, several times. So. Uh, this is an indication of how it might be more uh, revealing to go by job characteristics than by occupation. And then in the last line, you see how many migrants are in each group. And basically the pattern that emerges is that in the two groups on the left, um, there are rather few migrants or just some um, and uh, hardly any recent migrants. Recent would be arrived in the last five years. Um, but on the right, in the two groups, uh, three and four, uh, you have quite a lot of migrants, around 30%, including a significant number of recent migrants. So basically, next slide, please. The pattern that emerges, I've repeated here on the top. So you have a uh, few migrants where job conditions are, are in, where jobs are rather good or good, and you have many migrants where jobs are rather bad or bad. And uh, why is that pattern emerging? Uh, so two things that uh, we want to highlight here is firstly about required qualifications that we also have in these data. And uh, the groups on the right just have a lot more room for um, workers with rather low qualifications, um, whereas they would face barriers much more often in the groups on the left. So that is almost certainly a factor but then we also have information here, that's the next graph uh, that um, shows you what is important to workers um, of all sorts of backgrounds um, in their jobs. What kind of job features do they want? And if you start from the left, then you see, okay, adequate pay is important to everyone. So is job security, so is recognition. Some differences uh, begin to show between these three, uh, three columns, which are native born, recent migrants and settled migrants, some differences begin to show about further qualifications, basically opportunities to learn uh, when it comes to contribution to society. But really what we want to highlight here is how uh, recent migrants um, seem to be uh, much less interested uh, in, in avoiding time pressure in their job and also much less interested in having autonomy in their job, but somewhat more interested if you look to the end uh, about opportunities for advancement. So what, we, what one can take away here is that uh, in many cases, migrants uh, cannot attain the good or rather good jobs due to low qualifications, but in particular, recent migrants also seem willing somehow to accept certain undesirable job features. All right, that's it. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you. That's, uh, so I will, we will take questions at the end of the, set of the uh, contributions. So I'll immediately hand over to William Hines at OECD, if you want to un unmute yourself, William. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm just going to try to share my screen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, systemic resilience. I've just been adapting my slides a little bit based on what I've heard in the first session. But um, we all know the context, which is, uh, of course, COVID-19. And uh, I think the first point I'd make is that COVID-19 probably just reveals the world as it really is. And um, that world is very interconnected. It's complex. 
there's all sorts of emergent crises that can, can emerge. And in general, we, we tend to focus a lot on triggers, things that uh, you know, cause these types of shocks, but um, really probably we need to think more about the underlying system. Uh, and so it's not just a matter of pandemic, financial crisis, geopolitical tension. All of those things can happen, but uh, we really need to think about the underlying structures. And um, COVID-19, uh, I like the analogy that uh, Ken Rogoff from Harvard made. He said that this type of shock, it's like a Rorschach test for what you already thought about the world. So everyone said more than ever, we need to think about X. And uh, so people who've been working on resilience, that's especially true because we think everyone should be thinking in terms of resilience. And as was mentioned earlier, this um, concept, there's many different ways of thinking about it. And we tend to use the one that is more from a scientific engineering perspective. And uh, our partner at the OECD is the US Army Corps of Engineers. And they've really been thinking about the resilience of infrastructural systems, information systems, and how to combat a whole range of different shocks. And so that's uh, where we come from. Uh, the, I just added this slide, uh, but we've also been working on individuals and uh, on psychological resilience. And we've just issued a paper on brain capital in uh, molecular psychiatry, which is a, a paper produced by a, a range of medical doctors, uh, economists, social scientists, and others. And it's looking at brain skills and brain health. And can we Think about these concepts in a way that would be useful uh, to think about how people will respond to various different shocks. And brain health and brain skills are uh, essential to understanding the, the economy as it is today, uh, one that's increasingly digitalized and globalized and where there's a, a range of different shocks. And COVID itself, um, well, in, in general, brain health disorders account for maybe three trillion upwards of three trillion dollars per year. But uh, during COVID, there's been um, a rapid increase because of these confinement measures uh, in a whole range of psychological issues like depression, anxiety, social isolation, substance abuse, loneliness, uh, cognitive decline. And if you're thinking about migration, think about migrants themselves, but also receiving in uh, people in receiving countries, how are these changes going to be incorporated and how are people going to deal with these types of issues? So just to mention, but there is a, a paper we just published in Molecular Psychiatry that I'd be happy to share. Uh, but I'm going to think less about individual resilience and more think about the systems, uh, the big human uh, made systems that we deal with, uh, global value chains, healthcare systems, and um, our socioeconomic system. And uh, Tom Friedman had an article in the New York Times when all this started called How We Broke the World. And uh, his argument was that we've been removing a whole range of buffers, safeguards, redundancies, regulations that uh, provide resilience and protection when big systems get stressed. And we've been removing these out of an, what he calls an obsession with short-term efficiency and growth or without thinking at all. And uh, we often get accused of um, by our economist friends that, well, you're against efficiency, uh, but we're not really against efficiency. We're just saying that if you think about the, the structures as complex systems, then the one thing we know about complex systems is they fail all the time. So you need to really think about introducing uh, often uh, what economists might consider rigidities or things that will keep them from going off track. Um, but really, we're moving into a world where we need to think about efficiency and resilience. It's not just one versus the other. And uh, th this is clear when we think about what the world economy is, uh, where you're dealing with uh, heterogeneous global production networks, 50 million firms, billions of physical links, interacting with household networks, 2 billion households, 3.3 billion workers, trillions of links, uh, and a web of contract in the trillions and ownership patterns where a few firms and individuals own, own almost everything. And that last point is actually a, a major element in the resilience of our systems. Because if you have monopolization and ownership structures where there's just a few providers, a few suppliers that can introduce great vulnerability into the system. So it's probably more efficient, but uh, 
it can make you susceptible to these systemic shocks. So these, uh, the, the whole system itself is intricate, it's interlinked. And uh, these interactions of all these di different interacting components can lead to all sort of, sorts of emerging properties at the macro level. So that's quite a different way of thinking about the world economy than traditionally we would look at it in economics, which is very much a top-down equilibrium system where you have a shock and uh, then you'll gravitate back to some sort of steady state. But probably what COVID has highlighted is that the, the economy doesn't really work this way. Uh, so we have uh, a system which is very much subject to a whole range of crises, cascading failures, and there's a list here. Uh, and these risks are actually amplified by a whole range of things, many of which are related to, to migration, but the in intensification of inequality, hyper complexity of finance, uh, the concentration of critical capacities and monopolization, environmental emergencies and climate change, etc. And why we should be worried as policymakers is not only the, the increasing frequency uh, and intensity of these shocks, but it's the, the way in which they're all linked. So it's the cascading uh, from system to system. So as I said, mainstream economics uh, tends to think about shocks as being exogenous, but just like the weather, which uh, changes all by itself, uh, these complex systems can be subject to endogenous crises uh, and dynamics. So we probably need to think, rethink the way we, we look at economics and the economy. Uh, the standard approaches, again, has put an emphasis on efficiency. And if the 20th century was really about competition, flexibility, and making markets work better, uh, then the focus probably was on efficient outcomes. But in the 21st century, uh, dealing with all these interacting systems, we probably need to look a lot more at coordination management of the system and its overall resilience. Uh, here are some examples. We're already subject to a whole range of systemic challenges, uh, many of which I've mentioned. Um, but again, we see that these crises can emerge from anywhere. Um, the, since 1940, intensive agriculture has been associated with more than 25% of infectious diseases that emerge in humans. Uh, so we again, we see the food system interacts with uh, nature, with biodiversity, and that can lead to a major health crisis, which then becomes a a major economic and social problem. So basically, again, you shouldn't try to deal with triggers because um, that uh, you'll miss a lot of these interconnections. So we've, um, as I mentioned, we worked with the US Army Corps of Engineers to develop concepts, ideas, and we've started to apply them to various different systems now. Just an example of how this complexity of the system can lead to vulnerability. This is a structure of supply chains. And traditionally, we relied very much on a pyramid structure where you had um, you have these different tiers of suppliers, but um, you had substitutable um, suppliers further down in the supply chain. And so if one supplier got knocked off for some reason because of a natural disaster or the company failed or whatever, then you would be able to substitute away. But increasingly, supply chains are more of a diamond structure so that multiple tiers of uh, the system are reliant on individual suppliers. And so if that supplier goes down, you have a cascading failure. Uh, so this is really important to how we structure things. And again, we've seen massive consolidation in a whole range of uh, industries where in, in the 1990s, we would have had many, pro many producers which were geographically dispersed because of globalization and an emphasis on resilience, uh, on efficiency within supply chains. We've tended to take out a lot of these nodes, meaning that the whole system is a lot more vulnerable. And so we saw that uh, at the start of the crisis where you did have these cascading failures where companies were not able to source particular components and inputs into the production process because China went down initially, then Northern Italy, and then this cascading failure. So we think you need to look at all these uh, issues of preparing, absorbing, recovering, and adapting to these shocks. Uh, the, the threat is always going to be uh, different, but in the case of COVID, it was the, the spread of a pandemic. Then the system, how vulnerable is it? How much loss of functionality are we going to see? Uh, again, different examples. Uh, we saw 
ventilators initially being uh, quite in demand, but PPE uh, and a whole range of services around health and, and other things. And then the consequences, again, we're dealing with those consequences right now. And there's a lot of discussion about whether we can learn lessons from this crisis and build back better uh, and really think again about how these systems operate. So COVID has been a multi-system challenge and uh, ideally we like to think about bouncing forward instead of just bouncing back. Uh, but there is a really a lot of discussion about, you know, how can we get the system back on track? Uh, and, but this is an opportunity where we can actually rethink things. So it's not just about getting back uh, and bouncing back, but can we actually reorder things uh, that would make them more resilient in the future? Here's some ideas about how you would um, institute, implement a uh, resilience approach, design the system to be resilient, recoverable, and adaptable. Uh, policymakers often don't like to talk about redundancies or uh, stockpiling or having slack in the system because we, we like things to be efficient. But sometimes that makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but certainly it's something we do need to think about. Then obviously quantifying resilience, uh, trade-offs between efficiency and resilience to guide investments and decisions. Uh, control system complexity, often that's uh, a relatively simple matter as we illustrated with supply chains. It's just uh, having more diversified uh, thought about potential suppliers so that if one goes down, you do have some redundancy and an alternative supplier. Then um, there's other ones, uh, resources, redundancies, system crucial components, and uh, real-time decision support tools. So all of this, is a, it's a very active agenda. There's a lot happening in this area. But uh, just to conclude, uh, so COVID-19 reveals the world as it is. It's complex, interconnected, but fragile. We need to think about individuals, how they interact, and what sort of emergent properties that leads to at the system level. And then I think the key takeaway is that we, in thinking about our socioeconomic system of which of course migrants play a, an important role, we might need to think about going from competition, flexibility and optimization to coordination, management and resilience. And uh, it's not what you do, it's the way you do it. Uh, so it's, um, these are major questions and I think we'll develop over the weeks, months and years to come. So thank you. Thank, thank you, William. That was a fantastic presentation and, and fitted very nicely with the first presentation as well. I think we've really got some great perspectives on uh, resilience as it applies to migration, but also thinking much more widely about issues around uh, systemic system characteristics and resilience. So what, what we have now are two commentators who both speak for around five minutes each. Uh, uh, Laura Corrado, who's the head of Unit of Legal Pathways and, Mig and Integration at DG Migration Home Affairs of European Commission, and Christian Kupsch, who's a senior specialist in migration policy at the ILO. So first, I, I'd invite Laura to unmute herself and contribute. Yes. Over to you, Laura. Yes, thanks very much, Andrew. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope the connection remains stable, otherwise I might switch the video off <laughs> if there's a problem. So thanks very much for inviting me to this uh, quite interesting discussion on connecting uh, systemic resilience and, and labor migration. I have to say that this is something quite innovative. It's, it goes beyond our traditional thinking, which is good. I like being challenged. Um, so first of all, I, I would like to, to say that, of course, I, I, I totally agree that, um, you know, the extent to which labor migration helps us addressing the labor, the skill shortages, however we define them, is a deeply political choice. I mean, we, I have seen it every day, I think, for uh, when discussing and negotiating with the member states, how political this issue is. Uh, and it's not only a question of, uh, you know, uh, economic analysis, assessment, rational discussion. It's really very political because of the trade-offs that you have highlighted, Martin, in, in the papers with, uh, you know, with the level of wages and so on. Uh, and also the fact that this is very deeply connected to labor market, uh, economic and social policies. Now, this seems obvious clearly, but uh, from a European perspective, I have to say that it has not been easy to, to really have this connection function both. And if I say it, it's both within the European Commission, while we have, of course, been working very much with our colleagues dealing with employment and economic policies, but it has been always challenging. Uh, 
first line, which makes it very difficult sometimes to integrate the labor and economic uh, discussion. So I think this is a, a first challenge in general, I mean, uh, which however then has an impact when we talk about uh, labor migration and systemic resilience. Um, so I like the approach that you propose because indeed uh, it obliges us to look the policymakers a bit beyond the short term, the electoral cycle, so medium and long term, which I think it's something that is really needed. And I think it's um, it's also I, I like what you highlight that it also uh, allows us to have a uh, Laura, can you hear me? We, we're losing you. Could you switch your camera off? I think that might help if you can hear me. Could you switch um, your camera but off? If we, look, um, if we look through the lens of the, of the resilience, we, we can have a different look at, at those. Um, I think it also gives an additional argument to, to look at the at migration as something concerning not only the destination countries, but also the sending countries. Of course, we do involve the, the sending countries in the discussion on migration, what we call it a comprehensive approach. But I think indeed this is even more important when you um, talk about, you think about the, the resilience of the whole system. And it's also, I think it's good that it takes away indeed the, the, the discussion from how do we protect the citizens, the domestic workers from migrants, uh, because then we have a different perspective of looking at, at the, um, how do we protect the services, the essential services. And I think in a way, one of the positive aspects of, of this crisis was that it allowed us to see at, at migrants as people that can play a very key role, an important role in, in, uh, in essential sectors for, the, for addressing the pandemic, while at the same time highlighting the, the vulnerabilities. So now I come with my questions, with the challenges that I see and my questions to you, which I think um, will be discussed also for the, for the follow-up. So my first uh, challenge, and this has to do really, uh, as, a, as a policymaker, I always ask myself the question, okay, that's a brilliant idea, how do we, how do we implement it? How difficult or how easy, how easy it will be to, to implement it concretely? Uh, so as you highlight, I think there are a lot of variables when we look at the role of migrants in, uh, in certain sectors. First of all, I mean, it's difficult to define what are the key sectors. And then uh, as we have seen, migrants uh, have different uh, for different reasons. So, so um, in that sense, how easy it will be uh, for a policymaker to, um, for whom, I mean, it is already a challenge to think in the long term already in general. And then to assess the role of migrants uh, of labor migration in strengthening the systemic resilience, giving this, this diversity, what tools can be used? Because as you know, and as you say, there are the traditional uh, tools when we talk about migration in terms of sector skills, like you have the labor market test, you have the, the shortage occupation. These are traditional tools that all member states or many, they use them to different extents. But now, uh, if we want to see migrants as, uh, you know, as an element to, to strengthen the resilience, which concrete tools can we use, can a government use to do that? Because this is more complex, obviously. Uh, and then another question which is linked, uh, another challenge I see is, uh, yes, it's indeed necessary to look at a transnational system of products and, uh, and services, even not only specific occupation or sectors and even beyond the borders. But again, um, in terms of, of a government, which policy tools, with which policy tools can we do that? I mean, um, it, it's more complex because then you, you see these concerns a lot of occupations maybe across sectors, and then if we have the relation with a third country. So that will be very complex for a government to, to do. Uh, and then maybe one last comment more for, for Mr. Heinz about, uh, you know, the very interesting presentation and the trade-off short-term efficiencies versus, you know, having some buffers, redundancies, and so on. Now, having worked for, I think, almost 20 years very close to politics, maybe I've become pessimistic about <laughs> what politics can do and how. And as I said already, this means really uh, going beyond the short term effic efficiency, means looking at the longer term, uh, beyond your electoral cycle and the capacity also to learn from, from the lessons uh, uh, from a crisis. 
And how confident can we be that, uh, that governments, politicians, policymakers can learn from this crisis to avoid the same mistakes and to, to really prepare for the next crisis somehow, because indeed this entails costs. And I mean, what was striking, um, and my colleagues working with health in preparedness and so on, what was striking when the pandemic uh, exploded in, uh, in March, February, March, was how little prepared were the member states um, on health response. I mean, in terms of not only, I mean, stocks, equipments. I mean, my colleagues in, uh, in the commission, uh, the commissioner, I think she said it, uh, Kiriakides, she was shocked how, how little prepared, in spite of the fact that there had been a lot of preparedness, uh, of course, in the past years. Because, of course, you have, uh, you know, you have um, a system of fiscal restrictions and so on, so you don't think of investing until you have the problem. So how confident can we be that uh, then this is, will be really a lesson learned in general for the future uh, and will allow us to be more resilient? I know this is a difficult question, but I throw it on the table for discussion <laughs> and I will leave it here for now and I'm happy to, to contribute to the debate. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, Laura. Uh, we, we did actually turn your camera off from our end because we were losing you, but I don't, just for brief moments of time. But uh, I think there's some problems with the with the connection. Okay. But I think we, we okay. but I thanks, hope... thanks. No, we got we got the point you made. So thanks very much for that. Uh, and, and now, as I said before, we'll gather questions. Uh, and also, if, you, if members of the audience want to ask questions, they can ask them using the chat function, directing their questions to Migration Policy Centre. I'm very happy now to invite uh, Christian Korpche, Senior Specialist in Migration Policy at the ILO, to comment. So uh, over to you, Christian. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Um, this is absolutely a super project um, and I'm happy to comment on two very brilliant papers. Since I want to make five points, I better start right away. Um, my first point is about the systems approach as, as such. Um, William Haynes in his paper says about it, the system approach can promote cross-sectoral multidisciplinary collaboration in the process of policy formulation. And he also refers to integration of policies. And indeed, in the ILO, we would call this an integrated approach, and we have a lot of experience with this. This is exactly in line with the ILO's decent work agenda that seeks to reconcile economic and uh, social policies and to create, create coherence and promoting simultaneous work on its four pillars of rights, employment, social protection and social dialogue. And similarly, the ILO's fair migration agenda calls for the embeddedness of uh, migration policies. So this from this is a very, very welcome approach um, from the ILO perspective. My next point is about um, the unit of analysis. Um, Bridget Anderson, Friedrich Paschel and uh, Martin Roos call for sh a shifting focus from the nation state to transnational systems. Uh, this, I suppose, is, I find is a very important consideration and in the light of existing global supply chains, throughout the world, um, certainly the right thing to do um, for all the reasons set out in the paper. Now, there's also the suggestion uh, to move from protecting the employment of citizens to protecting the provision of essential services. And here I find this seems to take us back to the nation state uh, a little bit to some extent, um, because the underlying question seems to be um, how can a state use migrant workers to arrive at resilient systems? Um, Bridget, Friedrich and Martin um, very rightly warn that prioritizing systemic resilience could lead to deteriorating working conditions and greater exploitation of migrant workers, justified by the very need to preserve the functioning of essential services. So then... Um, I'm asking the question, can these undesired sort of side effects um, be avoided? And I would say perhaps yes, if one accepts uh, that building systemic resilience has its limits. And limits is the third point I'd like to make. Um, somehow in line with Immanuel Kant's idea that the freedom of one person ends where another person's freedoms begins, 
we should be aware that not anything goes when we make systemic resilience our overarching objective and look at how migrants best fit in such systems. From an ILO perspective, um, migrant workers' rights and principles of equal treatment among workers clearly represent limits. Um, Bridget, Friedrich and Martin actually also hint to migrants' physical limits to exploitation when they say that people may temporarily tolerate harsh working conditions for the purpose of a better future. But then my question is, there's probably only um, X amount of self-exploitation that is possible for X amount of time. So where system resilience is to be built on the back of migrant workers, to sort of to say, this then raises the question of how resilient migrants actually are. And this question in turn um, is linked to the issue of temporariness. A temporary migrant um, having entered a country under a temporary foreign worker program is very likely by definition to be working under different parameters um, that can lead to unequal treatment with uh, national workers. As, um, uh, <clears throat> and as uh, Bridget, Friedrich and Martin point out, sometimes resilience is built on this. So in, on the other hand, the longer term view um, that is required by res uh, systemic resilience then raises the question about the design of temporary foreign worker programs. And I think that's a research question that we will have to face uh, in future and perhaps under this project. Um, in building a new um, research agenda, we also don't want to make ourselves guilty of dehumanizing migrant workers. We want to look at migrants as workers, as humans, as agents of change, and not as factors of production. And just to give you an example, I think there is a difference for me. Um, if you um, A, show that migrant workers currently uh, have an important role in making food supply, health, uh, or other systems work, or B, if you ask the question, or you want to analyze how migrant workers can best serve as economic buffers. And this is very much joins um, William Haynes' point um, made in his project presentation at the very end. I think collectively we'll have to keep in mind um, that the framing of our questions sometimes bears risks. Last year, the ILO constituents um, in the ILO centenary declaration have underlined that there should be, and here I have to cite, a human-centered approach for the future of work, which puts workers' rights and the needs, aspirations, and rights of all people at the heart of economic, social, and environmental policies. So here, this is really, I think, the importance to have a human-centered approach in whatever we do in our future research and also policy making. And that was the first point. And my last point um, is sort of um, about diversity and equality under systems approaches. I think linking systemic resilience and labor migration may actually represent an opportunity for more equal outcomes in labor markets. We all know that where certain jobs become migrant jobs, uh, shunned by local populations, there is no more way to ensure um, that migrants receive equal treatment because the question arises equal with whom. Um, and migrants therefore risk to become the global underclass, sort of the underclass in every single country. And here, I believe systemic resilience approaches should certainly counter that type of trend with their insistence on diversity as flexibility. A system is not safe if you only rely on one group of worker. And I'll end it here, and I hope I only look, took five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, yeah, that's about five minutes. That was a fantastic job getting such great points across in five minutes. Uh, grateful to you and Lara for the comments that you've made. I think there's questions for both of the presentations, but I'll just add some additional questions that we've received. Uh, so Monique Kramer has a question for the first presentation, in particular to Friedrich, uh, uh, to ask him to say a bit more about who are recent migrants. Are these refugees? Are they people from Eastern Europe? So some clarification there. And Monique also asks, uh, in relation to the figure that Friedrich showed in the first presentation, uh, saying that 
the COVID-19 crisis may not be one shock, but several. Uh, and, and Monique asked whether the academic literature on resilience also gives an answer to this, this question perhaps of multiple shocks. Uh, and for William, Friedrich wanted to just ask a question to uh, William's presentation uh, about what uh, Friedrich referred to as the optimal, am optimal amount of resilience uh, and trade-offs between short-term efficiency and long-term resilience. So trying to determine, as Friedrich puts it, optimal amounts of resilience. So I think that uh, with those questions, there's quite a nice agenda for our presenters. And I will hand back to uh, Martin, Bridget and Friedrich, whoever wants to uh, pick up those points. Thank you, Andrew. Um, maybe I'll pick up. Um, thanks for all your questions. I'll, I'll respond to Laura's question about what it might mean um, for the practice of, of, of policy making. What are the policy tools? Um, I suppose one way of thinking about it is, is the um, issue of systemic resilience, the, the importance of, of resilient central services part of the conversation when policies are being made. So for example, um, I was for quite some time on the Migration Advisory Committee in the UK that was drawing up shortage occupation lists. And uh, many people here will understand how shortage occupation lists work. You find out, is there a shortage? And if there's a shortage, sh you know, should we recommend immigration? And typically when this, this analysis is done and when these recommendations are made, it's mostly about efficiency. Is it in the interest of the economy? And it's about distribution. It's about who, who, who benefits, who loses, are there sufficient domestic workers? And one question would be, well, should there be another consideration, for example, when you draw up shortage occupation lists that have to do with systemic resilience? So is, is for example, is there a strategic interest in providing particular sectors of the economy, such as the health sector, with, my, with migration? Should, should, should the employment of migrants be made easier in certain sectors for reasons to do with resilience? I'm not saying that the answer should be yes or no. It would very much depend on, on, on the context. But, um, you know, you, you, for example, you could have points-based system that give five extra points for the employment of migrants in particular types of services because there's a particular demand for resilience reasons. I mean, this is just one, one example. But I think, I think you're right that it's hard, certainly at this stage of our thinking, to think of very concrete tools. But I think a, a very big um, question is whether resilience is part of the systematic thinking that also encourages policymakers then to ask the question, well, what exactly is the effect? And you know, what is the role of migrants in our fund, uh, essential services, not only short term, but also longer term? I don't know if Bridget or Freddie want to add something to that. Yeah, thanks, um, Martin. Maybe um, I'll just sort of reply to some of the sort of general tenor of the questions. Um, so, um, but firstly, in response to William's paper, just to add that I think that it is really important in our understanding of um, how systemic, global systemic resilience uh, functions, is that we do appreciate that a lot of the uh, so-called employers that we're talking about are actually very large um, transnational companies, multinational companies, um, uh, and because of the sorts of monopolization processes that William was talking about. So actually, in thinking of interests and trade-offs, I think that um, it is important to sort of divest ourselves of the imagination that we have, you know, an employer with 25 employees who must be engaged with as to whether or not they want to employ migrant workers. Um, the second is whether we should also be thinking about <clears throat> uh, whether it would help in our thinking to think about the role of mobility and migratory processes in systemic resilience, um, as well as the role of migrants, um, whether that would help sort of shift some of the conversations and analysis away from um, thinking about um, uh, individual cost benefits and so on into, into a more kind of integrated approach. So I'm just kind of throwing that in there. And, and maybe that will also help us think about mobility as much as migration. That is, you know, this is 
yes, this is about um, um, international migration, but it is also uh, uh, in, in certain systems, um, internal migration, non-cross-border mobility might be also um, important. Uh, and then to Christiana's point about the limits of resilience. I mean, in a way, I think that it is very important to say not anything goes. And perhaps one of the problems that we've had so far is precisely that anything has gone um, and that we need to sort of start thinking precisely about sort of um, putting limits around that. Um, and that actually, you know, thinking about resilience of of all of us and thinking about human resilience um, is uh, perhaps something that we need to put front, front and foremost. And yes, that also includes migrant, uh, migrants as well as citizens. And perhaps um, uh, then that goes to um, the point about, um, you know, well, what about the next crisis and the lack of preparation? I mean, I personally feel that, um, you know, there are going to, we, we are lining up for um, a whole line of different crises, I think, uh, along the, um, uh, in, in line, perhaps with some, something of what William was intimating, and that perhaps once we, that, that it is going to be important too, to make connections between what look like different crises, uh, in order to think about what fundamentally are our priorities and common interests. Friedrich, uh, well, Friedrich, because uh, I think there are a couple of questions for Friedrich, and then we'll hear from William, if, that, if that's okay. Yes, in the interest Friedrich, of time, I will uh, directly address some of the um, uh, specific questions uh, from Monique Kremer. Um, who are recent migrants? Yeah, that is everyone who has arrived in the uh, preceding five years. So they have had limited time to settle in. Uh, and they are um, in many cases in a particular labor market situation because on the one hand, they are under pressure to work and to earn either to sustain themselves in the country where they've just arrived and where they have little to sort of be, uh, to, to build on uh, or to uh, send money home um, uh, because their family might be at home and uh, the whole idea about migration was also to, to earn money uh, uh, for the family. So uh, in this sense, it is an interesting group to look at in, in, in terms of uh, what jobs they do and what jobs they um, end up in, say. So a particular segment of the labor market that might play a particular role for essential services and for the sometimes difficult tasks that are to be performed in these services, at least as they are laid out today. Um, and then on the several shocks, uh, yes, there are several waves now, and uh, I'm not aware of uh, literature on uh, this particular phenomenon of a pand pandemic with several, uh, several waves. Although um, it is um, a very interesting opportunity then to study resilience because we can look uh, eventually at the same country uh, and look at uh, different initial situations uh, before each wave and then see how that affected sort of how bad the shock played out, that how that affected resilience basically. So for the same country, we can exclude lots of other factors and we can look at how uh, the initial situation is linked to um, the, the uh, resilience during uh, each wave. And then hopefully uh, we'll see that countries do learn uh, and uh, we'll see how far uh, the pessimism that Laura Cordado uh, mentioned is warranted. Thank you, Friedrich. Uh, just quickly before I hand it over to William, just to remind people that if you do want to ask questions, please pose them in the chat function, direct them to Migration Policy Center. And uh, so please feel free if you want to write comments, suggestions, questions, please feel free. Okay, William. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks uh, for the question. Some uh, great points there. Let me start with Laura, uh, who talked about, um, you know, the political response. And uh, just to give you an example, I think you're absolutely right. I think there is uh, going to be a real problem selling this politically uh, that we should be building up buffers, uh, safeguards, stockpiles, things like that. And if you take Japan, for example, its healthcare system was seen to have held up quite well in the face of the crisis. And so it was a resilient system. Um, but the question is, does being more resilient in the face of a crisis compensate for decades of inefficiency? Uh, and that's a, a very different, difficult question to answer. Uh, the, I think it is true also that often politicians 
but not just politicians, businesses and even individuals, we're often playing for time. And we hope that the, the crisis doesn't happen on our watch. Uh, but we have very little incentive to try and uh, optimize over the long term. And essentially, that's uh, Friedrich pointed this out, that essentially that is the issue. It's short versus long term, that uh, we tend to be thinking about efficiency on a, on a short term scale, but resilience is something that's playing out over a long term. But of course, if there is a failure of a system, then uh, it's not efficient in the long term if it's a system that uh, fails. So we, we do need to try to integrate these things. Um, and I think that you see the political backlash when governments are caught out or seem to mismanage a crisis. Uh, and we will be subject to more and more shocks because of the integration of the global economy. So. And there will be these cascading failures. The financial crisis in emerging markets will not stay there. Um, a, a pandemic affects everyone. So I think given the nature of the shock society is facing, there will have to be uh, more emphasis on resilience. Uh, Friedrich uh, said, is there an optimal uh, amount of resilience? And there, conceptually, there's a lot of discussion about uh, windows of vitality and viability. And um, if you have too much resilience, then you might have stagnation. If you have too little, you'll have brittleness. And so there might be a kind of optimal level. Uh, conceptually, that's straightforward, but in practice, that's a, a much more difficult discussion. And the other issue is that that kind of framework of optimality works well when you're thinking about individual systems. And so typical techniques of risk management is to harden one component or one system. But because you can have these cascading failures, uh, you do need to think about resilience rather than just managing individual risks. Uh, and then just to associate with the comments of Christiane and Bridget that we really do need a human-centered approach. Uh, and in policy, it is true that we, we have integrated approaches all the time, uh, or at least we talk about integrated approaches, but they tend to be compilations of different perspectives rather than a truly integrated approach. And for that integration, we really need to think about non-linearities, tipping points, positive feedbacks, and all sorts of interactions that can lead to these cascading failures. Uh, so it's not just a simple matter of bringing together people from different perspectives uh, and sort of cobbling these things together. It's actually, you do need to take more of a scientific uh, sense of the system, how it's evolving, changing, and how it can fail. Thank you, thank you, William. Uh, so I, I just maybe like to put a question to the first presentation by uh, Martin, Bridget and Friedrich, which I think flows from some of the contributions that have been made by uh, William and also by Laura uh, in, in relation to kind of the political dynamics, because I did notice on one of your slides in sketching out this new agenda, you talked about rethinking the politics which I wonder if you just expand a little bit more on that because it seems to be fundamental to your, the connections you wanna make between research and policy. And you've got you've all got quite a lot of experience in this, uh, but it seems quite a bold statement because you know, particularly as we, we see that uh, the global and the transnational can be quite strongly contested in domestic politics across the world uh, and that attachment maybe to more traditional forms of politics and organizations seem to be quite strong so I just want you know, to, so rethinking the politics could seem quite ambitious beyond just the kind of making the policy, you know, pulling the policy levers and trying to secure policy change. Uh, I was wondering maybe if, if, if these statements about rethinking the politics could be fleshed out uh, a little bit. So, so I can maybe understand a little bit more about what you mean. Uh, we also have a, a from Liliana Keith uh, has, has posted uh, a question. So I will, uh, uh, so Liliana says she really appreciates the points made by ILO related to decent work equal treatment of migrants as agents and building on this and Bridget's reply, Liliana would like to ask the speakers if we can't integrate decent work and human resilience into the concept of systemic resilience. Uh, she, she asked rather than seeing them as, as separate limits that might have to be imposed. Uh, and she's, she's right from perspective of uh, PICOM. Uh, arguing that sectors are, are, are not sustainable when built on exploitation of migrant workers. So that's a question that's from Liliana Keith. So if we go back to uh, uh, perhaps, maybe go back to Bridget. 
uh, but maybe rather than take all three speakers from the first presentation, I think they were more directed towards Bridget. So if Bridget could respond, if that's okay, any others can maybe chip in later. Thanks. Yeah, hi, um, and thanks for that question about decent work and human resilience. I suppose if you think about the sectors we've chosen, which are food, health, and social care, they are actually, one might argue, sort of sectors or, or provide services um, that are fundamental to human resilience and survival, not to say survival. So um, I think that that is, uh, I think that's a really important point. And I think, but I, I, I would push back on the argument that sectors are not sustainable um, if they are built on the exploitation of migrant workers to say it might be that what we have at the moment is that is precisely what makes those sectors sustainable because um, this question of disposability um, efficiency and flexibility um, really are one might argue off the um, backs of low waged workers, many of whom are actually migrants. Um, the question is uh, um, perhaps goes to then the distinction between sustainability and resilience, um, which is something that we're kind of uh, the, um, the three of us are in conversation about. Um, what is the relation between sustainability and resilience? I don't have an answer. I'm just kind of just kind of putting it out there. Um, and I think in terms of the um, politics of migration, um, yes, Andrew, you're right, it is, a, it is an ambitious, you know, what we're, what we're proposing is ambitious. And I suppose um, what I would say, and again, maybe it goes to um, some of Laura's comments, is that perhaps we also need to think about the connection between the politics of migration and other kinds of politics. So rather than kind of um, ring fencing migration as if it is separate from um, many other policy issues, um, we actually need to be making the connections between them. And as um, Martin and I have done in our previous work, you know, we've argued that actually very often migration policy is not necessarily um, the first, uh, it sh shouldn't be, or shouldn't necessarily be the only way in which one engages with questions of the relation between migrants and labour markets. Um, and I think that it is also, you know, not so, so in a way, I think part of our argument is that we have to look not only at the national policies, but also at um, international policies and international relations and therefore yes introducing these questions of um, global that the global and um, at a time when actually there's a sort of increasing um, tendency towards nationalism I think is indeed a challenge. Martin you might want to add something. No just I mean just very briefly I mean I suppose you can ask a normative question to what extent the politics should change, but you can also ask the question, you know, is, is the concern with systemic resilience changing politics of migration across different countries? Why or why not? And uh, I think at this stage what we are also trying to do is, is point to various um, ways in which the politics might change. Uh, now, one obvious way is that um, in, a perception of interests might change. Um, so generally most countries privilege high-skilled over low-skilled migration, but many migrants work in, in what are typically known as lower-skilled jobs, also in essential services. So one question is, well, will this crisis now lead to a rethink of, of the role that these migrants play and, and uh, reshape interests? And will that then impact on policymaking? Another idea is to think about systemic resilience as an idea, uh, as a pol is this a new policy goal that changes things? And uh, you know, in, in what countries does it become that goal? And in what countries does it have real consequences? And in what countries is that not, not the case? And um, that also goes to the distributional point. I mean, we're not saying, I mean, we're not trying to be kind of naive and say suddenly countries will stop thinking about protecting domestic workers as one of the policy goals in labor immigration policy making. But obviously, Resilience arguably could be an overriding goal that you know we have a common interest in making sure that systems stay resilient, and that means that um, we think about employment conditions, for example, not only 
in, in our own countries, but also along transnational supply chains. So, um, so for example, um, it's not good enough to say, um, you know, we don't need to produce certain products at home or produce, we can rely on, on, on global production, global supply chains, if we at the same time don't show any concern for, for example, how migrants are treated along those global supply chains. So, so the politics might change, might become slightly more internationalized in, in that sense. Um, not because you know, people are particularly enlightened about this, but because some of the interests are changing. So the idea is that I think there's an opportunity now to see whether and how this concern with systemic resilience changes the politics um, across different contexts. Thank you. Fried, did you want to add anything before we go to William? Um, yeah, just basically uh, in response to your question, yes, uh, a new politics of labor immigration is uh, uh, ambitious and, uh, uh, and sounds like a big change, but in a way there is a rare window of opportunity here uh, in the sense that there was uh, so far a narrative missing for why you would want to have a strategic, a conscious policy um, about uh, labor migration of medium or low skilled workers. So uh, that has changed. I mean, so far it happened, it already happened, but it seemed to be in a gray area where there was um, like, yeah, no strategic policy. It was more like responding ad hoc to, um, to needs of the economy. Um, so that has changed a lot now. And there's also, um, because it has changed so publicly that uh, the um, attention um, um, yeah, low and medium skilled migrants working in the central services have received a lot of attention and that can be, uh, that can provide a political capital to say, okay, yes, it, it might be a good idea to have a strategic policy also for this sector of labor migration. Thank, thank you, Friedrich. So we're, we're coming to the end of the session now. Uh, I, uh, I'm not seeing any other questions, but what I wanted to do was ask if uh, Laura and Christian had anything that they uh, wanted to add in response to the responses. Uh, obviously, it's not an obligatory, but uh, first, I'll ask, ask you, Laura, if there's anything you'd like to contribute. Thanks. Thanks very much. No, I'm I'm grateful for the for the replies. I mean, for the feedback I got from Martin, Bridget, and so on, and I. And I think, uh, yeah, I understand that there is a window of opportunity to rethink politics, not only maybe of migration. Um, and I will, I will try to be less of, of a pessimistic and see that uh, this gives opportunities to, to, to really think differently. Um, and I think it gave me also ideas, um, what you said, um, the last point about seeing different, Friedrich, I think, differently the role of low and medium skilled workers, because we are stuck in this debate on the European level where you have the member states and the counties saying, no, we don't need to have anything regulated. Like, you know, a council, no, low medium skilled worker is bad or we don't really need that, we don't need to talk about and we absolutely need to regulate. So I think it gives an interesting perspective which we will try to integrate into this debate also into on the European level about the role that also low and medium skilled workers can play. So I will take this back with me. Um, I hope you, you heard me uh, in spite of a uh, yes. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I apologize, I cannot stay for the follow up but please keep me posted on the on the further work on this, and uh, I would be happy to to continue the the discussion in the future on this. Thank you. Thank th thank you thank you very much, Laura. Uh, Christiane, is there anything you would like to uh, contribute? Uh, yes, just a second. Um, I could only say that indeed I I could agree more with some of the answers that were given. I had I had not really asked any questions, but um, yes, I, I fully agree with um, uh, Bridget's comments about um, how the current system is actually very much built on um, an exploitative system, and how um, I agree with uh, with Martin's point that um, we can hope that a different view a different way of analyzing things will also change politics in the end so i would take an optimistic view there um, and therefore i find um, this is an absolutely fabulous um, 
um, initiative. And on the uh, on the point that um, was raised by William, I, I I think it's a very important point to to say that it's not enough just to um, have a vision of um, sort of integrated policies, which is just a supplement of policies, just putting policies together and working in parallel, that's perhaps really not enough. And um, that's also something that um, perhaps we have to do better at the ILO. Uh, th th thank you very much, Christian. I'm, just, uh, I'm also, we, we do actually have a couple of questions that are coming. One is directly for William, if it's okay, because it relate, it's a, a, a question from Be uh, Bettina Rudloff. Uh, uh, it's a question for William, who I hope can uh, still hear me. Uh, and, and what Bettina asks, are the existing policy guidelines of the OECD on risk and resilience uh, already applied in some countries? Are there examples? Is there, is there need for further operationalizing resilience? Uh, uh, and, and whether the guidelines may be used as a basis for this? Although I, I think Actually, because I'm looking through my participants, is I think William has another appointment, is no longer with us. So we, what we can do is send that question to him. Uh, or is he with us? I'm still oh, here. Please. Oh, sorry, William. So did you, did, you, did you hear that? Yes, I did. All right, great. Thank you. I, I saw you didn't see a Melissa participant. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, no problem. So just to answer, I think um, guidelines on risk management uh, I think every government has risk management and uh, the guidelines are, are followed. But I think what we're arguing is that risk management is it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for dealing with the types of shocks that we have to face. And that risk management is not really the same as uh, taking a systemic resilience approach. And there it's much less developed. And I think we do need to develop uh, more structured guidelines for how we deal with these types of shocks because we're good at dealing with uh, shocks that are quite linear and focused on one particular sector. So that we have tools, we have uh, risk management procedures, but these cascading failures needs uh, something a bit different. So I, I think uh, there we still need to do some work. Thank you, thank you William for that, thank you. Uh, we, we also, we are running out of time. We do have a question which came in from Anders Niergaard at Linköping University. It's, a, it's quite a, a, a long question. I think what I might do with that is, is, is I don't think we'll have time to deal with the question with this, uh, 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 which is uh, kind of very broad and multifaceted, uh, but it seems to me to go really to the heart of the project that Martin, uh, Bridget and Friedrich are developing. So that the question will be shared and it forms part of the agenda and we can maybe respond to that uh, more directly to, to Anders uh, and uh, uh, develop uh, and respond to uh, the points that he made. Uh, but as I say, we, we are now out of time for this first session. So I would like to thank uh, particularly William, uh, William Hines, Laura Corrado and Christian Kupch for participating in this session. We're really grateful for your input. Uh, and obviously also to Martin, Bridget and Friedrich for their contribution and for putting the conference together. We take a break now for, uh, sorry, I'm trying to multitask or multi-screen. It's not proving easy. We take a break. I think it's for 15 minutes. I'll just double check so yeah, I'll give you the right information. So yeah, we take a 15 minute break. And then we the second session is on uh, migrants, cross-country supply chains and systemic resilience. Uh, so if you want to join us again at 10.45, and also I would uh, uh, recommend that you take a look at the accompanying website where there's a series of contributions around the themes addressed in the conference. So on that, I would propose to we conclude this session and uh, hopefully we'll see you again in 15 minutes for the second session. Thank you very much to everybody.